Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope, and we are in the heading, False Idol Awareness Month. False Idol Awareness Month. And we are dealing in a part five to the spirit of Christmas. Uh, this is the spirit of Christmas. This is not a favored topic amongst professing Christians. But uh, I'm a nice guy and I like people to have truth. I sought after truth. Um, there was a point in my time where I lived my life as a lie, but now I'm seeking truth. I would hope and pray that people all around the world that are seeking truth will actually be consistent when they say they want to seek truth. That means seeking truth in every area of your life. So in our heading uh, today, since we're dealing with False Idol Awareness Month, the Spirit of Christmas Part 5, we have these, this specific topic that we're dealing with in the Spirit of Christmas. And this is going to be a special topic. Uh, we are dealing in the historic and legendary figure of St. Nicholas. The historic and legendary figure of St. Nicholas. This is going to be broken off into at least three parts. So we're going to start with the first part here. And this will be based upon the transcription of Pastor James Knox of the Bible Baptist Church of Deland, Florida. Okay, I've already uh, covered, you know, the first, uh, you know, half, I wouldn't say half, but at least the first, you know, quarter of what, what is mentioned in the transcript. So what we're going to do is we're going to start in this section of the transcript, and I'm going to be reading you this sermon preached by Pastor James Knox on the spirit of Christmas. So this is the historic and legendary figure of St. Nicholas. Let's get started. All right. Let's take up an historic figure by the name of St. Nicholas. What do you know about this man? Very little. Most of it is legend and speculation and fable. And yet from this man has evolved the person as we know as Santa Claus. And so we'll do well to see what we can find concerning St. Nicholas, probably the most inclusive and most comprehensive statement is found contained in the work by Coffin, that's spelled C-O-F-F-I-N. And I will quote this, because it summarizes what is found in the other encyclopedias and writings. So this is from the book, quote, Nicholas, the saint who started all this, is a genuine folk figure. Everything we know about him comes to us through oral tradition. The first written legends have been transcribed for about 500 years. That is 20 generations after his death. One of the earliest recorded facts about Nicholas, dot, 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 unquote. Okay, this is directly from the book from Coffin, okay? Now, you have to watch these secular writers. You have to watch these non-Christian writers, in the first two sentences, he told us that the man is a folk figure, and everything we know is through oral tradition, and that, and that it's a legend. You heard that from the quote. And now in the second statement, he is referring to what is about to follow as fact. And most people read on and accept that. Listen. A folk figure of oral tradition who is legendary is not synonymous with fact. Come on, we, we can agree on that, right? That's, come on, we're using, you know, valid rational reasoning for this, okay? So it just takes a reasonable person to understand this. So you see, one of the big problems you're going to have getting along with me, and we're, 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 we're reading the transcript from Pastor Knox here, uh, you know, one of the big problems you're going to have getting along with me and one of the big problems in which Greek scholars and Bible scholars and religious people, pastors and preachers and teachers, the big problem they have getting along with me is I went to school. I didn't study Bible. 
When I went to school, I didn't study theology. When I went to school, I didn't study eschatology or harmology or Christology or pneumatology or angelology or demonology, and I didn't study Greek and Hebrew. When I went to school, I studied English, and I studied communication, and I studied journalism. Therefore, I'm very well versed in the original English. So for those of you that are new to the broadcast, I am reading a transcription from Pastor Knox. So that's not me. I'm not the journalist, okay? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just reading to you the sermon here, okay? Therefore, I can read. Therefore, I can cite and spot the construction of sentences. And I've learned to recognize when a man is wording things in such a way as to kid you, and when a man is wording things in such a way as to tell you something that's straight. Therefore, to start out and say that Nicholas, come on, we're talking about St. Nicholas, is a folk figure, the product of oral tradition, and is legendary, and then try to get me to accept what follows as recorded fact, no, 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 no. No, you go kid some guy with a PhD in divinity, okay, you go try it on him. Don't try it on us who have learned to read the English language. Now, one of the earliest to record facts, and I'm quoting, so I have to give it to you that way. Here's the quote about Nicholas was Methodius a 9th century patriarch of Constantinople who tells us that the saint was born in Patera, a town named after one of Apollo's sons. The date given is quoting Methodist or Methodist sometime near the end of the 3rd to the beginning of the 4th centuries. That's some kind of fact, isn't it? Okay, the location is Lucia in Asia Minor, what is now southern or southwestern Turkey, except for the fact, there we go again, the fact. So you see, listen how people, listen, how, listen to how they work. This is how the world educates people, except for the fact he was probably Bishop of Myra. What are you talking, what are you talking fact, and then give me a probably? See, you can't get your facts straight because it turns into subjective opinion and legends and fiction. There's no fact to probably, any more than there's a fact to maybe, any more than there's anything definite in saying if. The fact probably, how about a certainty maybe? How about the positively might be? How about the, the certainly could be, the definitely might happen? How about the inside reverse outside? How about the backward sideways could be sometimes? If in with it out. Maybe certainty sometimes. Do you see how it works? See what happens to people that don't read? You know they browse through literature and pick out the parts they like. And the reason I take time to tell you this is when we go to the scriptures, you're going to say, quote, well, that's your interpretation. That's how you read it. That's how you look at it, unquote. No, we're going to look at how it's written. We're going to check the original English and check it carefully. Now, I've got to quote the man, quote, except for the fact he was probably Bishop of Myra during the reign of Diocletian was imprisoned to be released when Constantine came to the throne. We really know nothing about him, so little that, in fact, in 1969, the Pope made his anniversary celebration optional for Roman Catholics and dropped his day from the calendar, unquote. That was an earth-shattering event. Quote, nonetheless, we were assured he was an only son of parents who were widely known for their good deeds and kindly manners, and like a true folk hero, he gave early manifestations of his pious nature, even observing the prescribed fast days by rejecting his mother's breast during infancy. Oh, I tell you what, there's a sucker born every minute in the world and two born every minute under the shadow of Rome. Look, I'm not on here to be funny. I'm on here to read you the history 
of this day that people so long desire to practice and celebrate and observe. So, quote, later, the most persistent legend about this side of this side of his personality is also said in earlier years. It seems there was a noble family whose fortune had been lost. The three virtuous daughters resolved to recoup these losses for the beloved Papa by selling their bodies and be sure and to be sure their souls. Nicholas prevented this catastrophe three nights in succession. He threw bags of gold from the street into the girl's home, changing poverty to wealth, adding and allowing virtue to take a firm stand. Because of this, three bags of gold have symbolized his name. And roll and the tail has grown up that the money was tossed down the smoke hole where it landed in stockings which the girls had hung by the chimney to dry. Isn't that interesting? Sure it is. Quote, before long, this good man becomes involved in miracles de designated by God to fill the archbishop's seat. The good Lord intervened in the dispute of the aspiring bishops and Nicholas was at once faced with a crisis. A woman excited by her chance to see a heaven-selected archbishop rushed forth, forgetting her baby, who was sitting in a pot over the fire waiting to be bathed. Suddenly, remember, she implored the passing celebrity to do something. Nicholas bade her to turn home where she discovered the child unharmed. Playing with the bubbles in the boiling water, he makes the sign of the cross, an X. Over an uncontrollable child driving the evil from his body, he restores to life three scholars whose bodies were hacked to bits and stored in pickle barrels by an innkeeper who had murdered and robbed them. He quiets storms so that sailors were returned safely to harbor, unquote. Oh, I tell you, how much more can you take? Let's see, quote, let's keep going. The most famous miracle of all involved the great famine that swept the land. As men, women, and children starved, Bishop Nicholas went down to the docks and approached the ships as they stopped en route to Alexandria, begging, excuse me, begging each to unload a portion of its cargo to receive the hungry of his people. He promised the sailors that whatever had been offered would be restored by the time they arrived at their destinations. Not only did the grain of the ships miraculously find itself returned, but the portions, which were not left, increased sufficiently enough to feed everyone for two years. As the evidence from this miracle came in, the Bishop Nicholas gained a large number of immediate converts, and so on. Quote, It is only natural that such a man be reported among the discussants of Nicaea in the year 325, when the first ecumenical council of the church was held. In spite of the fact, his name does not appear on the list of those attending the council and is not mentioned by a single ancient historian. Nicholas is deemed to have been the most honest churchman there and in taking the lead in crossing the heresy of Arius, a priest who maintained Christ and God were not of the same substance. Unquote. So, quite an interesting fellow, is he not? There, there's a lot of legends surrounding that man. You say, are they possible? Maybe. You think so? Let's go to the next section. The person of Santa Claus. The person of Santa Claus. We're going to do this one section here. We're not going to go into the section after this because we're going to run way over time, okay? I want people to get a hold of the, the little information I'm giving right now, okay? So the person of Santa Claus. Does history matter? Yes. Do facts matter? Yes. Does the root of why somebody would be celebrating something matter? Yes. Okay? It matters. 
Come on, it matters that the founding fathers of our of this of this country, it matters who they are. It matters what they believe. It matters what we believe about this country. It matters what we believe about the flag. It matters what we believe about our lives every day. It matters what we believe about what we're working for when we go to work every day. Is this legitimate to work for? Is it immoral to work for this person? Well, what's the root of this company? Is it based upon wickedness and immorality and unrighteousness? I don't want to work for nothing. Thing that's going to cause the harm of society, the harm of people, the immoral structure of my life, the immoral structure of my family to affect everything that deals with, with my life and, and, and practice of what I do every day in my life. History matters. Morality matters. The root of what something is matters. All right, let's keep moving here. Moving in love, amen. Moving in love. So the person of Santa Claus. Again, we're reading the transcript from Pastor James W. Knox of the Bible Baptist Church of Deland, Florida. Let's get started. It's just about time to deal with the history of the most beloved man in America. A man who people are longing to see. A man who people adore, worshipped, magnified. A man that parents want their children to know, to love, to trust in. A man that parents encourage their children to petition, to look for, to wait for with great anticipation, to prepare gifts to give him and to have and and to have for him at his coming. And even yes, even when boys and girls grow up, because they've been trained in this way, many of them never depart from the lies. They never lose sight. They never lose confidence, though many of them have never seen this man. They love him. Who is he? Is it the Christ of God? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world? I don't think so. Rather, it's a man by the name of Santa Claus. You know quite a bit about this man. You know he lives at the North Pole. You know each Christmas Eve he flies around the world leaving gifts for the good boys and girls and gifts that are made by elves. You know he's well fed, has red rosy cheeks, white hair and beard, and wears a red suit trimmed in white with a black belt and black boots. Henry Livingston's famous poem, a visit from St. Nicholas. Ever read the poem? Did much to fix our present concept of Santa Claus. Prior to Livingston's poem, he had been recognized as a tall, slim, rather grave figure, was followed by a pony and a cart rather than riding sleigh and reindeer. Livingston's poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, fixed some major modifications in the Santa Claus legend. Okay, did you guys did you guys know that? Did you guys know that Santa didn't have a sleigh and any reindeer? We're talking about the original Santa Claus in history. He's a tall, slim, grave looking guy. He probably looked pretty creepy, okay? Was followed by a pony. He didn't ride a pony. He was followed by a pony. All right. Number one, let's do it. The poem reduced the size of Santa from a tall and stately man to a short and plump one. Secondly, the trimmed red bishop's robe now had white fur upon it. And thirdly, he gave Santa jolliness in place of dignity and composure. Because this world would never stand for anyone stern and grace and serious, we had to make Santa somewhat happy and loving and one that goes around patting everyone on the head. The Bible says that God made man in his own image. And ever since the fall of man, man has been trying to make God his own, in his own image. So it's only natural that modern men would picture their God as fat, jolly, and happy. 
The concepts of Santa Claus have changed slowly and only in the last two generations has he become exclusively jolly and cheerful. He was most fully established in concept from the cartoons of Thomas Nast, printed in Harper's Magazine in the late 19th century. These fully fixed uh, this fully fixed the picture of Santa Claus in the minds of people throughout the world. See that? You say, I, I, I celebrate Santa Claus and I do this and I do that with Santa Claus. And I ask you, where does Santa Claus come from? And you don't even know this much? Come on now, get educated. Get educated. A poem fully published in 1821. We're talking about fictional poems. We're talking about made-up fantasies are the ones structuring who this Santa Claus is. You guys getting this? A poem fully published in 1821 by Harriet Butler was the first suggestion of reindeer in connection with Santa Claus. 1821. You mean everything before 1821? It was even unheard of for Santa to have a have reindeer? Right. Because, look, first of all, you don't know what the history is. Now, when you start learning the history, you know, people say, well, I just don't care. We have it now. And you don't know why I do it. That's not why I do it. That's not why I celebrate it. Sure. Okay. Keep believing that. Keep, look, the Bible says, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Okay. You want to be ignorant? That's you. I mean, you can just walk around and just tell everybody you're ignorant. I mean, people don't do that, by the way. Um, people don't sit there and walk around and say, I'm ignorant, and glory in their ignorance. But you know what the Bible commands us to do is to not be ignorant. That we have a complete word of God that we can know all truth concerning God in the mind of God so that we could refrain from being ignorant. A poem fully published in 1821 by Harriet Butler, I just read it, was the first suggestion of reindeer in connection with Santa Claus. Rudolph came along much later. So here in 1821, you still didn't have Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? Rudolph came along much later. He was conceived originally by Robert L. May from Montgomery Ward advertising campaign. So this the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer came from this Montgomery Ward, came from this guy, Robert L. May, in 1939. Look, his story was, was a giveaway item for the Christmas season of 1939. <coughs> Excuse me. Two and two million copies. Two million copies of this story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer were distributed that year. They just made it up. They had just made up the fairy tale. The tale was not used again until 1946. So 1939, they, they, they did it for that year, and then it got cut off. Nobody heard about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer anymore until 1946. When, when three and one half million copies were distributed. The tale was first produced commercially in 1947, but still Rudolph really didn't catch on until a song written by, you ready, Johnny Marks, the legend of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which many of you can sing right along with it. You couldn't sing the old rugged cross, you couldn't sing when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But you could sing the song of Rudolph. You couldn't sing, oh, that will be glory for me, or down at the cross where my Savior died. But you could sing the legend of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. This song by Johnny Marks was recorded by Gene Autry and Bing Crosby. And between them sold over 50 million copies. And the tale was here to stay. Yes, even amongst Christians or people that profess to be Christians who don't got their brain in correctly. Come on. It's one thing being ignorant and you just don't know. Okay? And it's another thing being willingful ignorant 
and you could know, but choose not to know. And God says you could know, you could educate yourself, but you say, I willingly don't want to know, and I want to be in my ignorance because it's bliss. There you go. Isn't it sad to see a Christian turn his way from wisdom? Isn't it sad to see a Christian turn his way from the turn away from the truth? Come on, when we're dealing with this day, people don't care about truth anymore. Come on, it's all about my heart and how I feel and my emotions and and family and and what my family, all the false beliefs my family wants to believe. Let's keep moving here. Reckon we could sell 50 million copies of In the Garden? How about 50 million copies of Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross? Come on, can we sell 50 million copies of that? How about 50 million copies of I'm a Soldier of the Cross? No, that stuff ain't going to sell because it's true to the fact of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. But you can sell Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and then try to repackage that as some kind of a Christianity? Seriously? It's not likely, is it, that you're going to sell 50 million copies of any hymn in the, in the hymn book? Not in a Christian nation anyways, right? You know, this world is just about gone mad. I hope you understand that. Brother Roloff calls it an insane asylum run by inmates. You won't go through a city or town anywhere in the United States next holiday season without seeing Santa Claus in stores, on light poles, in windows, and decorations of varying sorts and kinds. On Christmas Eve, your local television station will take their weather radar and track Santa Claus so you can follow him. They're in the spirit. They're in the Christmas spirit. There will be parades in nearly every city welcoming Santa Claus to town. Millions of people will view the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade to see the first arrival of Santa Claus. You remember the Macy's Day Parade? You could actually watch it on YouTube. Back in the days when Brother James was writing this transcript, they were doing it, physically seeing it or watching it on a TV program. People will allow you, as, as we said in our introduction, to curse the Lord Jesus Christ, throw the Bible in the garbage, can mock God, but, quote, don't you dare say anything negative of, or critical of Santa Claus. Don't teach my children that fornication is a sin. Don't ride my children about being born again. Don't give my kids a hard time about staying up late and who they're and who they run with and how they dress. Don't you bother my kids about that business. But you'll let them have Santa Claus. You'll let them have Santa Claus. Okay, let me give you some examples of this world's attitude. Gamaliel Bradford, quote, says, Santa Claus alone still lingers with us. For God's sake, for heaven's sake, let us keep him for as long as we can. If God is in heaven, he must agree that Santa Claus is all right for the world, unquote. Gamaliel Bradford, you're about the dumbest stump that ever walked. Do you know that? You're enough to make a man believe evolution. You're just about a few thousand years behind. That's the world's attitude, you see, swearing by God, which Jesus forbade, swearing by heaven, which Jesus forbade begging in God's name that we believe in Santa Claus. John D. Gluck founded the first Santa Claus Society of New York, the Santa Claus Society of New York, which got letters to Santa, uh, Santa Claus from the post office and attempted to do for youngsters whatever was expected of Santa Claus. The society was met with overwhelming popularity and societies like it soon sprang up throughout the United States. Great. A lie begets more lies. A little leaven leaven at the whole lump. Come on. People lie and people love lying and they'll spread the lies so more people will believe the lies. You start talking about the truth, people shut down. You think the truth is going to spread? 
It's a very rare thing when truth spreads. Lies will spread everywhere. All right, James H. Barnett. Let's talk about that. James H. Barnett, in his book, America's Christmas. This is a book not listed in our bibliography. Remember if I, I gave the bibliography? You can go ahead and add that to your list of books that I mentioned in the bibliography. I don't know how many broadcasts ago, okay? So you just watch the whole uh, False Idol Awareness Month series that I did here on this Facebook uh, channel. You can go to my profile page. Just click on my click on my, my little logo, that little picture you see on your screen. Click on that. It'll take you to my profile page. Scroll down on all my posts, and you'll see every, every single broadcast I've done on False Idol Awareness Month, and within, I think, the first... Uh, first or second, I think it was the second broadcast I'd done on False Idol Awareness Month, you can get the bibliography for all the books that are referenced in this study, okay? So James H. Barnett wasn't included in that bibliography, so you can include that within the bibliography, okay? James H. Barnett in his book, America's Christmas, this is, a, and, and it cites a 1936 ruling by Judge Michael A. Musano of Allegheny County Criminal Court in Pennsylvania ruling that any doubters of Santa Claus be held in contempt of court. Seriously? Any doubters of Santa Claus would be held in contempt of court? This is the stupidity we got to deal with even in our day and age. I think it's even more stupider now than it was back then. You say, who did that? Who would do something like that? A judge presiding over a court of law in the educated, intellectual, refined, modern United States of America. Right. Also, Judge John Hatcher of the West Virginia Supreme Court were not talking about some yo-yo spinner out of a, on a porch somewhere, um, out in the front of a, a country store in a town of 200 people. We're talking about a judge on the Supreme Court uh, of one of the 50 United States in the 20th century, of course. When man has been enlightened and advanced and educated, Judge Hatcher included in a particular sentence, quote, let legislation outlaw evolution if they must. Let the Constitution be amended until it looks like a patchwork quilt. But rob not childhood of its most intriguing mystery, Santa Claus. Unquote. Are you serious? This is the stupidity of people that are in your court system. Anyways, praise the Lord it was back then. But I mean, you won't say it, praise the Lord for back then, but people are just as stupid now. So I. Here's a man that's making decisions who will affect thousands, possibly millions of people from his position on the bench of the West Virginia Supreme Court. And this man says he would rather see the Constitution amended till it looks like a patchwork quilt than have anyone attempt to criticize, overthrow, or do away with the belief in Santa Claus. How do you take, how do you take these people seriously? How do I take Christians seriously when they practice this stuff? Probably the most well-known, widely published, and well-read documents in the Santa Claus lore of our day and generation in a letter first printed September 21st, 1897. Leading up to this time when nearly everyone was getting into the Santa Claus Act, professional sentimentalists like Bret Hart and Broke Bradford wrote stories about Santa Claus. Poems, songs, and sermons were devoted to him and his activities. We find that if it came that if it came doctrine that children should never be disillusioned of Santa Claus, and most adults never forget that write a passage when voices revealed there is no Santa Claus, on September twenty first, eighteen ninety seven, the movement received its doctrine. I'm quoting Coffin. Now, that was one of the books that we listed in the bibliography. Coffin is C-O-F-F-I-N. Once again, 
as Francis Church, an editorial writer for the New York Sun. Quote, Dear Editor, I'm eight years old. Some of my little friends say there's no such thing as Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, as in Baal, come on, that's what I'm saying, as in Baal, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Unquote. Do you want to ask me that question? No, people, people won't normally ask Brother Ed the question. And I definitely know people ain't going to want to ask my pastor the question. What we're talking about right here, uh, the, the, the written letter to this uh, Francis Church and editorial writer who was quoting this. Do you want to ask me that question? I'll tell you the truth. But what this man is going to do is define for us in 1897 a doctrine which will pervade for the next 100 years of human history, and that is the definition. The doctrinal statement, which the world will accept defining the spirit of Christmas. Annually, in nearly every newspaper across the United States and many papers throughout the world, this statement is printed and reprinted at the time of the winter solstice. The church right, or church rights, quote, Virginia, your little friends are wrong. Okay, this is the, ed the editor, okay? Virginia, your little friends are wrong. What did they say? They said there was no Santa Claus. This man says they were wrong, right? Ain't that what he's saying? Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. Now, wait a minute. They do not, or, or they do know, believe, except they see, sound familiar. They do know, believe, except they see. So they think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little mind. So basically, uh, people like us who believe the word of God have little minds, right? Have you ever read John chapter 5? All minds, Virginia, so he's quoting this, all minds, Virginia, whether they are of men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant. In his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exists. And you know that they, are, that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if, as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith. No what? Childlike faith? Look, he, he goes on to say, no childlike faith, then no poetry no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight, the eternal light. Now, mind you, when he wrote this, he capitalized eternal light. Santa Claus, Santa Claus is eternal light. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished, unquote. You understand that statement? No Santa Claus, no eternal light. You understand that? He's saying that if there's no if there's no Santa Claus, you don't have any eternal light. Now look, let's let's continue on in what he's saying to Virginia here. He continues, quote, "Not believe in Santa Claus, you might as well not believe in fairies." How can you not laugh and mock that to scorn? You might get you might get you papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus. But even if you did not see Santa Claus come down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Seriously, I feel like I'm talking to an atheist right now. <laughs> oh, 
Of course not. But that's no proof that they are not there. This guy believes in fairies. <laughs> Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders that are unseen and unseeable in the world, unquote. Then he quotes again, goes on. You tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside. But there's a veil covering the unseen world, which uh, not the strongest man, not even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Seriously? Then he goes on to say, only faith, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain in view and picture the supernatural beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world, there is nothing else real and abiding. Seriously? Real and abiding? Glory beyond? A veil in between that must be rent by love and faith? Wait a Come on, your mouth drops wide open when you see this blasphemy here. He continues, let's keep moving. He continues on and says, no Santa Claus? Thank God, he lives and lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia? Nay, 10 times 10,000 years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. Hold on, hold on really quick. You see that that's like a that's like a a, a a a confused almost like really like see the eyebrow go up right there it's like can you see it it kind of goes down like that it's like that's one of those things like do people really believe this stuff <laughs> and the answer yes <laughs> oh what a what a mess, ain't it? Ain't it? Ain't it a mess? Okay, Christian, that's shocking. That is the doctrinal statement on the spirit of Christmas, right there. We just read it. Now I don't have to twist your arm or pound this desk or rant and rave and scream for you to know that's the world's attitude concerning Santa Claus. That's the world's attitude concerning Father Christmas. And I'll tell you, some of you think I'm extreme and you think I'm fanatical and you think I get overworked. Maybe I do. But after reading that, I'm going to have to pause and catch my breath. It's just a little too much to realize the spirit of Christmas, which is so prevalent in our world today, is a spirit that would lay claims accepted by masses and multitudes, a spirit which would make claims like those which we've just read about. All right, you guys, uh, you're not ready for this yet, but we're going to get there. And we just finished our two sections and it's the spirit of Christmas. It's, you know, it's, it's not a Christian spirit and people want to say, that's not why I do it. And I'm like, well, why do you do it? Well, we honor Christ by you can honor Christ better than disguising a pagan day and disguising it as, as Christian. You can do better than that. God doesn't need a knockoff of Satan to be glorified. Look, I, I want to ask you, do you really want to glorify God in your life? Come on. If you're, if you're the sincere person and you want to glorify God in your life and you want to, come on, John 4, 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, you've got a big mess right there after we just read some history of Christmas. You've got a history there of something that's not even true. And you're going to rest the foundation of Christianity upon a pagan, something that, come on, just because you repackaged it, just because you're living in a society, in a whole culture that has repackaged what they want to call Christianity in Christmas, doesn't make it right. Look, Hitler, Hitler had a whole society believing like he believed. It didn't make it right for him to kill all those Jews. Look, just because everybody's in agreement with something doesn't make it right, doesn't make it true. 
Just because you have a bunch of people that have good intentions and everybody you know that has a good heart and they're a great Christian and they go out and they knock on doors and they witness and they street preach and they're, they're just the best person, you know, and they always help people and they do the Christian thing and they study their Bibles all the time. Look, just because you respect that person and he celebrates Christmas doesn't make it right. You know, people get angry at me. I, I have people approach me and say, hey, you know, I, I just don't think it's right what you're doing on your Facebook page, you know. The, you know, there's people that I know, they're real respectable guys. They love the Lord. You know, they, they're actually pastors and they preach the Bible. You're you telling me that they don't love the Lord? And they've been serving God for 30, 40 years. You know what I'm telling them? I'm saying, I'm not saying they don't love the Lord. They love the Lord. I mean, it's evident in their lives. There's a lot of people that celebrate Christmas that do a lot. I mean, when I first got saved and I started getting zealous for the Lord, I was still doing Christmas and I was I had a lot of zeal for the Lord. What I'm asking you is when you learn the truths of what we're talking about right now, come on, we're dealing with the history. I'm not just out here railing saying if you celebrate Christmas, you, you know, you're just this wicked Christian. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you are one of the ones that are celebrating this day and you just don't know why you're celebrating it, or you, you thought in your mind that this was a Christian thing to do, now it's time to get educated. And if you're the kind of person that's open-minded and zealous for truth and wants to know the, the difference between truth and error, righteousness and unrighteousness, and you want to say, I want to please God in every area of my life. Well, certainly you can see as we're going through the history of this thing, you are now enabled and empowered to get the information here on my broadcast. And I even give you the bibli bibliography so you can get the books to study it yourself. And I would, I would contend that we would try everything and hold fast to that which is good. You need to try these things by the word of God. But a lot of times, none of us try these things. We just assume them because we've been doing them all their all our lives. And we say, well, I look at Christmas, it can't possibly be wicked because we, we have, you know, emotional times together. The family visits. We have, come on. Guys, you're speaking to somebody that used to celebrate Christmas. I know the whole emotional thing that goes around Christmas. Um, my family is really held really strong to Christmas. And, and they were very, very much advocates of, of holding that day together to honor God. Guys, you're not speaking to somebody that's just walking on. You're saying, well, you know, you're not a real Christian if you're celebrating Christmas. I'm just saying, look, if, if you didn't know, well, you didn't know. It's, it's not your, I mean, I'll say it's not your fault, but you ought to educate yourself. But what I'm saying, if you didn't know, I'm not walking around saying that you're, you know, you're, you're just wicked person. But I'm saying now that you know, about Christmas, when, you, when you're done with these False Idol Awareness Month installment broadcasts, will you change your mind? Will you say, uh, just like when I was, when I first learned the gospel, you know, I know I couldn't go to sleep at night saying, well, I'm not going to trust Jesus because I knew the truth. I was like, I can't, I, I can't go to bed without trusting Jesus Christ for the salvation of my soul. See, when you start learning truth and it starts getting ingrained within you and the Holy Spirit's pricking you from the word of God and we, and, and, and we start looking at days that we really admire, you know, we got to say to ourselves, if you're really sincere and wanting to know truth and honoring God and worshiping God in truth, you would have to say to yourself, I know this is pagan. I know there's a root in, in paganism right here. And I know what Christianity did. And it wasn't even Christianity that did it. It was Catholicism that did this. And we all just followed willingly. You know, just when we were born and raised, your parents were born and raised, just assuming in the general generalities of just celebrating celebrating this day without anybody ever telling them why. And if they did tell them why, they just gave them some blanket statement like, this is Christian, it's Jesus' birthday. Instead of going to the Bible and learning it, wouldn't it be more honorable for a king to search a matter out? Are you kings and priests unto God? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be lawful for you as a Christian to seek out everything in your life to make sure that it truly does honor God? Instead of saying, you don't know why I do it, you can look to God and say, wait a minute, God, why should I do this? I want to please you, not me. I want to honor you, not me. 
I want to honor what you have for me in your word, not what I want to celebrate, not what I not not what I want to disguise or repackage or with a sincere heart. I mean, some people have actually have sincere hearts and they actually say, well, you know, I sincerely believe that this is Christian. All right. Well, I, you know, you got to give some practical things on this. OK, you have to. Because if I just read the history of this, people walk around and just say, okay, I know the history. And then, and they're, they're still putting up the Christmas tree. They're still putting the, the tinsel on the Christmas. They're still putting up the, the mistletoe as they learn the history of Christmas. They, wear, they put their Santa hats on as they're listening to me. <laughs> they, the kids are wearing, you know, the elf costumes as I'm telling them that elves are wicked. <laughs> It, it just, it really, it just doesn't matter for some people. Now, those people aren't the ones I'm, I'm obviously going to reach. You know who I'm going to reach? I'm going to reach the sincere person like I was. Like I was sincere in my life and I was ready. I was ready to learn the truth. I mean, it took me a long time to get to where I'm at now. I didn't say this all came overnight. But I'm saying that periodically, time after time, when God had grace for me, just like God has grace for you. God let me learn because of my desire to want to change my life and be, and be transformed in the renewing of my mind. Yes, I could overcome Christmas, even at the cost of some family problems, even at the cost of some friendship problems. I stood my ground on the word of God and I was fully persuaded in my mind, not because of pagan culture. I was fully persuaded in my mind because of the word of God. I wanted a walk with God that I didn't have to compromise. I wanted a walk with God that I could say, when I'm trusting God, I don't have to feel like a hypocrite. When I'm trusting God, I don't have to feel like, you know, I'm not truly giving God what he deserves. Now, I'm not saying I'm the pinnacle of spirituality. What I'm saying is, I think that we all uh, we all come short of the glory of God and that we all need God's grace to grow in him. But my question to you is, will you grow in grace in the Lord Jesus Christ and the knowledge and the knowledge and the knowledge of him? Does anything Jesus says matter? You say, well, the whole Bible is Jesus's words. Okay, if the whole Bible is Jesus's words, why won't you obey the, the simple things in there like learn not the way of the heathen. Why don't you obey the simple things that says walk not like other Gentiles walk? Come on, I, I, don't, I don't understand the, the reasoning behind that. I find a lot of powerful justifications. They're powerful because the, the reason why they're powerful is because somebody can take a passage of scripture, twist it, and then put their heart and soul into that twisted passage of scripture and make themselves believe a lie. And I can't, I can't stop you from doing that. You're going to do what you want to do. You know, many people know about this truth. Many people have probably popped into my broadcast. Many people have probably watched this replay or will watch this particular replay, but my other replays. And you know what they're going to say to themselves? There are going to be some that are going to say, yeah, that's good. I like education. I, I like learning new things and learning the history of things. But it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep doing what I always do. And then you're going to find others. They're going to be like, you know what? I never knew this. Wow. I, it's, it's amazing. I mean, he went through some of the history of this. It's really helping me. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to observe this day anymore. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. I want to have a walk with the Lord that's pure. Amen. You can, you can have that today if you want it. All right. So we are dealing again with the spirit of Christmas. This is false idol awareness month. If you're not saved today, if you're not saved, you haven't trusted and believed on Christ for the salvation of your soul. Well, now's the time to do that. It, look, every time I get on my broadcast, I'm going to bring you back to Jesus and salvation in Christ. Now, Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. He loves you. That's why he died on the cross for your sins. Yes, he even died for people celebrating Christmas. Right, he died for everyone. And 
even though you celebrate Christmas, even after you got saved, Christmas has never been a contingency on going to hell. I just, I'm just asking you, it's a contingency on your walk with the Lord, your relationship. You can't lose your salvation if you're saved, but you can certainly damage a relationship. You can lose a relationship. You can certainly um, have a minimal relationship. I mean, uh, you know, a partial relationship. I mean, a lot of people have these kinds of relationships. But I, I, why would you want a partial? Why would you want a half a relationship when you can, when God offers you the full relationship? Can you imagine looking at your wife saying, I don't want to give you all of my heart and soul. I'm going to give you some of it. But I'm going to, put, I'm going to devote my heart and soul somewhere else. I mean, the other half, I'm going to devote somewhere else. And you know, I just think that if you just look at this practically and spiritually, that it just doesn't fly. In biblical Christianity. When I read the verses in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brother, he's, he's pleading with you because you know, nowadays with Christians, you can't just approach most Christians with the authority of the word of God. You know, when I say, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. You know what I go, oh, oh, that's offensive. See, a lot of people don't look. So look, look at Romans 12. It says, I beseech you, He's pleading with you, okay? You don't respond to the authority, so will you respond to the pleading? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Do you remember the mercies of God? Do you remember what Christ has done for you? He, he saved you from what you did deserve, hell, the lake of fire, God's wrath. Do you remember that? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies. You want a Christmas message? Here's a Christmas message. Don't celebrate Christmas. Instead of celebrating Christmas, why don't you make your body a living sacrifice? Why don't you give God a present? Not for his birthday. Why don't you give a God a present for the rest of your life? Give God a present today. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, holy. Holy. You know what holy means? It doesn't mean defile it with pagan practices. It means holy. Holy, acceptable unto God. You know what I want to be? I want to be holy for the Lord in my body in all matters of practice. I want to be holy for the Lord and acceptable to God in everything that I do, which is your reasonable service. It's not, it's not about Jesus. It's about you. It's not about God, it's about you. Um, look, you say, but, but I sincerely think it's about Jesus. I really, I'm really doing it for Jesus. Well, I'm gonna leave room for that because I, I actually believe that one time I was doing it for Jesus too. And God had grace on me, just as God has grace on you. But what I'm asking you, however your motive is for this thing, when you learn the truth about it, why would you continue to do it? I, I can't for the life of me. I can't, I can't think of why you would do it as, as a, as a Bible-believing Christian. I understand carnal Christianity. I understand people that don't know the truth about this. But, but you, if you know the truth, why would you keep doing it? It's, it's amazing. My mouth drops wide open. Do you know that the rest of that verse says, and be not conformed to this world. Do you know what learning the way of the heathen is? It's conforming to the world. That's Jeremiah chapter 10, verse two. You're not supposed to learn the way of the heathen. Look, you were doing Christmas before you were saved. You were doing Christmas before you even learned the Bible. You're not convincing me that's Christianity. You're not convincing me. You can label it what you want. You can repackage it how you want to. You're not convincing me that that day, that day with those practices is Christian. You're not convincing me. Now, you can convince yourself. You can convince your kids. And that's on you. That's, that's between you and God, I, I guess. But you, you're not going to stop me from preaching against that day that's putting a stumbling block in so many people's lives. Uh, and they're eyes aren't even focused on Jesus. It's focused on presence. It's focused on pleasing your kids every year and getting them the bigger and better thing than last year. 
It's covetousness. You're teaching your kids covetousness. And Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, mm -hmm. covetousness is idolatry. Idolatry. People walk around and say, I don't worship the tree. Yes, you do. No, you don't. You say you're, to yourself you don't worship it. If you put that tree up every year, there's some worship involved because you got to sing those Yuletide carols. Now, what is the root word of Yuletide? Yule, <laughs> right. And you can add a little bit of Jesus in there. It's not the Jesus I serve. You can add a little bit of God in there. It's not the God I serve. You can add a little bit of joy in there. That's not the joy I get in Jesus Christ by worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Come on, you're not, you're not convincing me of that stuff. I live, a, I live a great life without doing Christmas. I have a fulfilled life. I have joy in my life. My child is happy learning the truth about that day. You know what? She, she's so thankful to me that I teach her the truth. But what about the kids? Yeah, what about the kids? You, you, you teach them lies? I feel sorry for the kids that are learning the lies. Look, it's, it's like this. You teach your kids about Christmas and Santa Claus and all the traditions that come with it. And then later they find out Santa Claus isn't real. And you were trying to teach them about Jesus. How much more are they not going to believe you about Jesus? Isn't it an integrity problem? Isn't it a lying problem? You know what? The lie goes a lot deeper. The lies go so deep that you lie to your kids about Santa Claus. You kiss somebody under a mistletoe, right? Anybody that gets under that mistletoe, and, and, and that person doesn't even have to be your wife. You have to kiss that person underneath that mistletoe. You violate in 1 Corinthians 7, 1. You know, where is the righteousness and holiness in Christmas that you claim is so Christian? Come on, all of the folklore that comes with all of the, the false gods and, and why they do these things, whether it's the Yule log or the poinsettia or the candles in the window. Come on, where's the Christian history of that? Other than the fact that your mom and dad did it and your, your great grandma and great dad did it, uh, your great great grandfather and great great grandmother did it. I, come on, show me where it's Christian. Show me where the church in the Bible, the church of Ephesus, was they were all gathered around the dinner table and they all they said, hey, you know, let's let's all pray for Christmas and then let's put up our Christmas tree after we're done praying. I want I want to know that verse. Where's that verse at? It doesn't exist. So I got many verses against it, but you don't have any verses for it. That's unless you got to cherry pick some verses. That's gonna be the problem, okay? So um, I wanted to add this last part on there because we just did a bunch of reading of the history of, of some of this stuff. And I think it's good that, you know, you guys get the kind of mindset that goes along with, you know, as I'm reading this. Because sometimes you just say, well, you're just reading that, but I know you really don't believe that. As I'm giving you practical things that, and, and just the mentality of it. When I start talking about the mentality of it and how, you know, Bible-believing Christians are viewing it, then, then you can kind of put, you know, put one and one together, you know, and, and you can kind of, you know, piece all of the worldview together and say, wait a minute, this stuff is really practical, it is realistic. Because now you have a, a, a real Bible-believing Christian that is actually trying to be consistent everywhere in the Bible, not just his favorite parts of the Bible. You know, and that's what people do. They have to skip parts of the Bible so they can maintain their congregation or they can, you know, come on, that's what it's all about. You got to hold on to your congregation. You're not going to hear preaching like this in a church. You're going to hear it by somebody like me who don't have a congregation. I don't have to worry about losing money in the church when 10 families leave because they wanted to celebrate Christmas. And, you know, and I preached the, the anti-Christmas message. It's just not going to go over too well. You're going to lose most of your congregation. And you know what? You have to sacrifice your Bible believers because there's only a few of those so you can keep all of the carnal Christians in your church. 
You'll sacrifice those Bible believers. If those Bible believers walk up and say, hey, what's this verse in Jeremiah 10 and Ephesians 4? Hey, what's, what's, what is this all about? What's this Mary, you know, you know people giving gifts and, and they're merry as they killed God's prophets and they're merry and joyful about killing God's prophets and they're merry giving gifts. Merry Christmas, right? I'm not saying that's a representation of Christmas, but certainly you can see them giving gifts, killing God's prophets. See, it's not about, it's not about God. It's not about Jesus Christ. It's about being merry and giving gifts to each other. It's all about self and covetousness. All right. So I, I understand you got your, your, you got a few people out there that you know, they want to say they're doing it the right way. You know, Christmas the right way. And I understand that. I, I told you I've been there, but now, but I'm saying when you learn the truth of the Bible, you got no more excuse to, to make those things justified. You've got no more excuse. You ought to grow, grow in the Lord when you learn the truth. So one more thing on preaching this kind of message in a church. That's why people's mouths drop wide open. That's why a lot of people won't get in a broadcast like this is because the people, the people preaching to them are preaching opposite of what I'm saying right now. I'm going with the Bible and you know what they're going to do? They're going to go against me. They're going to preach. Not They're not going to call my name out, but they're certainly going to preach against what I'm preaching. And I'm telling you, why? Why? For money? Why? Because you're, you're, you're weak in faith and you're, you're doubting the, the power of the word of God. You know if you preach it straight that you're going to lose people? The answer is, is sadly, it's yes. It's a sad thing. Church is already struggling as it is. And I mean, come on. Think of your average Baptist church that's out there nowadays. They're struggling just to keep the doors open. And you think they're going to preach Christmas? They're going to have anybody in their church. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about preaching. When I say preaching Christmas, I mean preaching anti-Christmas messages. Because they need, they need the people in the door. And most people, they'll leave out of a church if they hear you railing on Christmas. They're out of there, man. They, they ain't going to sit in. All right. Well, uh, we did our labor for today on this Bible broadcast. Uh, more of a history lesson, but, you know, nevertheless, we did cover some Bible verses as we were in here as well. So don't get bitter as, you know, I'm going through the history of this thing. Don't get angry. Don't just... Bear with me. I mean, I bared with it. I mean, there were times when I was uncomfortable. I was like, wait a minute. You mean you're telling me that Christmas is pagan? Wait, you know, I, I still do that day. Well, don't get all bitter. Don't get bent out of shape. You know, just listen to the history. Learn how all the customs were and how they were applied in history. And then ask yourself the question, is it justified to repackage something that's wicked? Is it justified? Ask yourself that question after you learn this. And then and then maybe stop for a minute, look in the mirror, take off the Santa hat, take off the elf clothes, and actually look in the mirror and say, am I really a Christian? Do I really love the Lord like I say I do? Why would I be doing this? It's like, it's like, it's like looking in the mirror after you celebrate Halloween. Come on, how, how come, you know, there's just people that walk around and say, oh, no, I never celebrate Halloween. But my friend, you people that walk around saying I don't celebrate Halloween because it's pagan and this and that, why do you not apply the same? You guys see the hypocrisy there. So you look in the mirror and you say, I'm not, I'll never celebrate Halloween. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not a, one of those kind of Christians. But you got Christians out there that do Halloween and you get all over them, don't you? You get all over them telling them they're not saved. You get all over those people that celebrate Halloween and they and they are doing the whole demon and devil costume and everything and they're Christians. Do you get all over them? You tell them they're not saved. It's the same thing. You can't go and tell those people they're not saved because you yourself celebrate a pagan holiday. You got to watch out because, again, you, you know, remember, when I'm talking about salvation, celebrating holidays or not celebrating holidays is no contention for salvation, okay? 
They, they, they make no difference in salvation. Now, if you're going to trust, if you're not saved today and you're going to trust in a holiday, then, then you got a problem, okay? But what I'm saying is if you believe and trust that Christ died for your sins and rose again a third day, the Bible says you're saved. Not till the next time you sin, you're saved forever, okay? So that's the point. And so take it in a good heart. Take it in a good spirit. Don't take it in a Christmas spirit. Take it in a good spirit. The spirit of man. Right now, you have a spirit of man. You got the Holy Spirit living within you. So you got a spirit of man. You got the Holy Spirit there. Take it in a good spirit, okay? So there it is. I hope you guys uh, enjoy these broadcasts. It's a lot. It's hard to preach these because it, it really rubs people the wrong way. Uh, people get so bitter and angry. And and I know, you know a lot of people had a lot of great testimonies on Christmas and many great, wonderful things happened to them around Christmas time. Maybe even some spiritual things happened to them around Christmas time. So it makes it that much more meaningful to them. Okay. But I'm not going to compromise the word of God because you had some meaningful times at Christmas time, okay? I'm just not going to do it. I mean, I feel for you. I do. I feel for people that they can't jump over this hurdle and they won't. I feel for them because I, I know that they've been duped by society and, and family and friends telling them that this is a Christian uh, this is a Christian holiday or whatever, you know, and I, I, I feel sorry for you. I, I have, I have pity and I don't say that being sarcastic or anything. I, I literally do because I was there. I was there, you know, I struggled with it. So don't think I, I, I wasn't even there that I, I, I don't have any empathy. I have a lot of empathy right now. And, but I'm just telling you, um, me having empathy for you isn't going to get you to change your mind. Um, you've got to look at the facts. You've got to look at the truth. And when you come to God and worship, you've got to ask yourself, am I really worshiping God in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24? Am I really doing that? And I hope you look at that. Look at that objectively, okay? So I do thank you guys uh, for joining me on this broadcast. Um, we're going to go out tomorrow um, in the evening as a church, as a church, you say, Brother Ed, you're the only one that believes this way. No, there's a lot of people in my church that believe this way. I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying there's a lot of people in my church that believe this way. My pastor, as we just read in the transcript tonight, um, my pastor believes that you ought not celebrate Christmas if you're a Christian because it's pagan, has pagan roots. So you're, you're not, you're not going to rebuke me and say I'm the only one that doesn't celebrate Christmas. You're not, it's not a rebuke. What it's telling me is that you love pagan holidays. <laughs> that's, that's all, I mean, if you're rebuking me, it's telling me how much of a stand and worship you really have for this holiday. Well, you're going to argue with me about it. It really shows you are worshiping that tree. You are worshiping that holiday. I'd be careful when you start arguing with me because people leave crazy comments on my Facebook page. And all that's telling me is, so you really do worship the day. <laughs> Anybody that can fight another Christian over that day, you're not convincing me you're not worshiping that day, okay? So uh, be careful. Uh, you're going you're gonna to expose yourself with me when you keep telling me I don't, that's not why I do it. And you know, you're hateful and you're mean and I'm not going to, I'm not going to friend you. You're an abomination to the Lord. When you start talking like that, all that is, is just evidence for me to believe that you actually uphold that day more than you uphold, uphold Jesus Christ. All I'm doing is upholding the Bible. All I'm doing is upholding Jesus Christ and the gospel. And that's, that's what I uphold. If you don't like that, you don't got a problem with me. You got a problem with the word of God. It's not me. I'm just a messenger. People like to kill the post, the postman, don't they? Oh man, look, the postman's bringing bills. Let's kill him, kill him. He's bringing us mail that we don't want. No, that's, that's irrational. You go to jail for that. You know what people do? They attack me because I'm reading verses like Jeremiah 10, 2 and Ephesians 4. I mean, they attack me. I'm like, why are you attacking me? You're attacking the word of God. All right. So, hey, man, I, I thought it was a good practical closing of this. So I've been on here a while now, and I hope that you guys get something out of this, and it'd be a blessing to you. And, you know, you can still be blessed and not celebrate Christmas. You can still honor God and not celebrate Christmas. 
You don't need Christmas to honor God. You know, you got people that the only time they, they even get close to God is around Christmas, right? Ain't that sad that a pagan day draws people, lies draw people? Come on, people want to look at that the reverse side. Well, see, that's why Christmas is good because it's the only time people will actually hear about God and Jesus Christ. Well, you know, if, if, if you want to use drugs to draw people to Jesus Christ, why don't you start serving marijuana in your church? That'll draw even more people. Hey, better yet, why don't you have uh, fornication parties in your church? That'll even draw twice as many people. Even better. Hey, why don't you have uh, raves and mosh pits? Man, you could triple your sales in your church. You could triple your tithes in your church. Who cares about morality? Who cares if it's heathen? Who cares about the immorality of it? Just do it. No, I'm not preaching that. I'm telling you, you're no different from those people that would do that. Come on. If you're a leader of a church, why would you not, why would you not lead your congregation on the highest road in righteousness as possible in the word of God? Why would you stoop down to the, to the dirt and the mud and the, and the grotesque vomit? Why would you put them through that? By example, why don't you be the best testimony you can be in your church? And it's sad, isn't it? It's sad. You got somebody that's not even a pastor of a church telling pastors to be the, the best example they can be. Ain't that sad? It takes somebody like me to say it. Anyways, let's we're gonna end it there. I do thank you guys for joining me on this KJV Bible Scope broadcast. We are in the False Idol Awareness Month, The Spirit of Christmas, Part 5. And the next time we get on, we're going to get a little bit deeper into Santa Claus. And we're going to go over the points of Santa Claus. Some, some major points of Santa Claus. Okay? So it's going to be like 23 comparisons which match Santa Claus of human mythology and the Santa Claus of pagan worship. Okay, so we'll do that in the next broadcast, and it's going to be pretty interesting, and it's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way, but that's not my goal. My goal is to get you truth. My goal is for you to have the best victorious Christian life you can have, okay? And you can have it without Christmas. You can. You might think you can't because you're still trusting in your own reasoning, but you trust in the word of God, you find you don't need that day. You don't need any pagan holidays. You don't need the Catholic Church. All you need is your trusty old King James Bible, the Word of God, and faith in the gospel. That's all you, that's all you need. All right, let's, let's, we're, we're done with this. My name is Brother Ed, and may the Lord richly bless you guys. Y'all have a great and wonderful evening.